talk about fears well, Let's talk about Friday, which means I am going to do this video and answer most of your comments and questions on the DeFeo murders that we did this week. If I don't get to your question or comment, sorry, uh, better luck next time. So, first one, Gustavo Vera. <clears throat> DeFeo hated his father, resented his mother, lamented his siblings. An abused child will have a very scrambled brain. He might genuinely not remember some details. That and being guilty aren't mutually exclusive. I agree with that. And in addition, he was very high on drugs that night. So you have to put that into consideration as well. Uh, DTC Primetime is the intro primus. No, the intro is Dallas Kincaid's Fear and Love. Robert Williams, I've always wondered about the kids sleeping through the gunshots, and I do think that they were forced on their stomachs not to face the killer. I've read that some will cover the victim's face so they are not even looking at them. Mark DeFeo had a broken leg at the time. I can't imagine it was painful to lay on his stomach like that. Allison DeFeo was facing the door and was shot through the, her cheek. Butch has claimed that Dawn had killed her like this because she was jealous of her looks and how everyone would tell her how pretty she was. All right. A couple things there. Let's break down. Number one, uh, the kids sleeping through the gunshots. I go through this if you haven't seen the video on the deep dive. How a lot of times, I, right off the bat, I would say yes. That's kind of odd. People would think that. But when you're sleeping at night and you're in deep sleep and you're a child, I can speak from experience from my children. They hear a noise, whatever it is. Let's say uh, something falls off the shelf and glass breaks. My kids are not getting up to investigate that. Do they know what a gunshot even sounds like at age 9, age 10? Probably, but they maybe they never heard one in real life. I don't know. Um, to me, it, if it did wake them up, maybe they just laid there with their eyes open, not one, you know, wondering what it was. Like I had explained, maybe in the other video, maybe it's like a dream to them. You ever have a, you're in deep sleep, something happens, something falls in your bedroom, something, and it kind of wakes you up but you don't hear anything else and you're not sure if that was a dream or if it happened in real life. Okay, so that's what I take out of that. That's what I believe happened. The killers of covering people's faces. Okay, now this has been a long, long standing uh, theme in investigating murders. And this came about, I believe, with... Uh, John Douglas and Rob Ressler, the FBI profilers in the 60s, early 70s, when they were interviewing suspects about their murders. And they were starting the behavioral analysis unit, criminal profiling. I believe that one of the indicators of remorse was the covering of faces. Now, I've learned that. that. That's been ingrained in me and all my training that I have done. 
Is it foolproof? Absolutely not. Just like anything else, it's not foolproof. But there's a good indication of that. Um, and again, I went into this on that deep dive video. There was no remorse here. Whoever did this. There was no covering of the face. There was no... Now, some people will say the women, it appears, were under the covers. Does that mean the killer took the time to cover them up and tuck them in because he cared about them? No. It's like that because that's the way they were killed. So, I'll move on. How many... This is from Mick Sailor. How many movies have been based on true events, but take liberties with the story, timeline, year, etc.? You can't ignore the facts by justifying the problems with the movie. Read the transcripts of the trial like I did. You may be closer to your truth that way. Well, Mick, I did read the transcripts of the trial. Um, and you're right, they take liberties in movies and, and stuff like that. I agree with that. I don't know what... I don't know how to take your comment there, but... I did read the transcripts. That's where I get most of my information from. Police reports and trial transcripts. 90% of my information comes from there. Because I'm all about the facts, baby. The facts. Okay? Doesn't mean everything that's in trial is a fact. But it does say that that is what was presented to a jury. And it helps you determine what they saw. Whether they convicted an innocent man, not in this case, or did they get it right, as in this case? Kathy, what about the fact that his father and grandfather were heavily involved in the mob? His father was stealing thousands every month from the car dealership. Okay, I addressed this in the deep dive. Yes, it is well-known fact that Big Ron was involved with the mafia, and so was... The wife's, Lewis, Lois's father, I think it was Mike Briganti. Yes, you are correct. However, if you know anything about the mob life, especially back then, uh, and I do, I'm not an expert, just like everything, I like to say that I know a little bit about everything, okay? So, and I think that's what makes a good investigator. You just have a little bit of everything in your, in your toolbox, you know, in order to combat these cold cases. So, like criminal profiling. I'm not an expert, you know. I started my master's degree course uh, with criminal profiling. I've been to schools on criminal profiling. And I've studied criminal profiling. I've worked with great criminal profilers and always quizzing them because you always want to learn you know when I was coming up uh, the criminal profilers I looked at was John Douglas um, Rob Ressler of course Richard Walter Mary Ellen O'Toole Mark Safarik I mean Jim Clemente the list goes on and I've had it a chance to work with almost every one of those. I've been to Richard Walter's home. He's the one who really got me started in this. He really treated me well. For people who don't know Richard Walter, he was the uh, founder of the VDOC Society. And I've had a couple of occasions. In fact, now that I'm thinking about it, when I went to his house, he was kind enough to give me this uh, bottle of Chardonnay. Sherlock's Cold Case Chardonnay. Never drank it. But, you know, willing, learning from him. Learning different things. Hold on, my camera's a little. Look like it got tilted there. Um, Jim Clemente. You know, Mark Safarik. I, I've uh, bounced ideas off of him in the past. Mary Ellen O'Toole, of course. And anyhow, in criminal profiling... It's just, it's a tool. I don't know how I got on that tangent about criminal profiling or knowing about the mafia. So when I worked for the FBI, and I wasn't an FBI agent, let's make that clear. Sometimes I see things online that says that I was an FBI agent. That's not true. I was a uh, Safe Streets Task Force member. 
I worked every day in the FBI office. I was sworn in as an FBI agent. I had to go to the headquarters in Philadelphia and get sworn in. Um, I got a FBI credentials, all that, but I wasn't an agent. You know, I just was basically assigned to them and had all the all the rights that they had. You know, getting federal subpoenas, search warrants, um, 301 systems, and writing the 301 reports. 301, I believe, was the FBI's uh, paperwork that they did. It had a whole it was a whole different system. Access the databases. And while there, I got the chance, it started out as a drug case, and it had mafia ties to it. So just like anything, I got really engrossed into that mafia life, learning about it. And I read about it, I interviewed people about it, and the case ended up being a political corruption case, a little drug case, all the way up to the political corruption case where... Uh, the one of the persons of interest in the case was a at one time a district attorney who then became a a federal prosecutor who then ended up becoming a senator then ended up working hand in hand with Trump. So it's amazing how it just started little. And in order to get that case going for the mafia, and because it was such a high profile case, I couldn't just start the case on my own. I actually had to go to Philadelphia to the FBI office and get it approved by the FBI individuals down there. Man, I keep going off on these, I'm back to DeFeo. But anyhow, yes, so I learned about the Mafia. To answer your questions, uh, no, it had nothing to do with this case. I'm confident in saying that. I don't know 100% because I wasn't there. But I will say that the Mafia, especially at that time, there's no way they would kill the children. Especially uh, if the problem was Big Ron, you kill Big Ron, and then that's it. If you wanted to make Big Ron suffer because he stole money from you, okay, let's just say on the off chance of that, you would kill the kids and everybody else and let him live in order for him to suffer with that pain. Okay, does that make sense? You don't kill them all. Mafia didn't do that. Mafia spouses, especially kids, off limit. You could rule that out. Sorry about that. Tyrant, I sometimes just go off on some things. David Knox, I think Butch killed mom and dad and freaked out, left the house, got back, Don killed the kids, Butch lost and killed Don. Hey, that's the that's the agenda that Butch has put forth. That exact scenario. I talk about that. I personally debunk that, and I don't believe that to be true. And I go into why if you want to go back and watch the deep dive video. Alright, let me scroll down here. They have found a potential handgun recently which could have been used in this. I've got a lot of comments about that and that's very curious because again, uh, the holster being found with the rifle scab, that bothers me in that sewer grate. So, if they found one near the area, I'm sure that area, there's probably tons of guns in the waters from crimes. but should still be able to pull a serial number off of that and be able to trace that back and see, you know, you should be able to figure it out if it was involved or not. So. Okay. Leanne Burke. I don't know if anyone has noticed this odd thing. Yes, I did. But if you look at the crime scene photos, all the females are tucked in, but the males are not. I addressed this in that video as well. The other oddity is how they are all found, each of them on their stomachs, where they moved in position to make it look like they were assassinated by the mob, or did he order them to lay on their stomachs? I'm betting they were ordered to lay on that position because Allison looks like she was shot when she was positioning herself. Her bum is up in the air and her stomach is not flat against the mattress. 
Uh, I, again, find it a little odd that they were both all on their stomachs. But I think that's just the way it was. I don't believe that he positioned them. Okay? I just, I don't, I don't buy that. There's no indication of that. The same with Dawn. Dawn's blankets, if you look at the crime scene photo, there was no indication of... I don't know, like, uh, they're, they're tucked, like you said, they're, they're tucked in there. It's almost, it's like they were just, they were sleeping there. And sometimes the simplest explanation is the correct one. You don't have to go and start searching and going down rabbit holes when you don't have to. Uh, that's one of the most important aspects of criminal investigations is it's usually what it seems. Now, it's not always what it seems. And I think that's what makes a good detective. Okay, you look at things and you let it make sense to you. If it makes sense, it's usually what it seems. But if you got to be able to think outside the box as well. So, yes, I think it's not. I don't know. I don't know if it's odd. I had one guy say that no adults sleep on their stomachs. Well, that's bullshit. I sleep on my stomach. I'm an adult. So you can't say that. Um, and I address more about this in the deep dive video. And I hate keep saying that, but go check it out. Zippy. The things that always intrigue me is that the neighbors didn't hear the gunshots either. But according to Jewel Martin, the first reporter on the scene, the neighbors did hear the family dog, Shaggy, howling and crying loudly. Okay, so I have an explanation for this. First off, you say, people will say, well... Why didn't the kids run? You know, they, well, how did nobody hear gunshots? Well, it has to be demonic. Well, that's not true. If the neighbors, who are still alive and can testify, which they did, that they didn't hear anything, what would make you think that the kids had to have heard something? Or the other people in the house? Maybe they didn't. A dog barking and wailing. Now listen to this. A dog barking and wailing, the neighbors heard. If that dog barked one time, Bruh! do you think those neighbors would have heard that? No. But compare that to a gunshot. So are they going to hear that? Not necessarily. But if the dog continues to bark for a minute, minute and a half, two minutes, now the neighbor wakes up and hears that. So that's my explanation for that, and I hope that makes sense. Uh, service dog how would the gunshot blast not have had at least some of the kids running through the house for cover I already addressed that they may have woke up doesn't mean they left their bed you know they're not going to run for cover they don't know what's going on they probably don't even know it's a gunshot would there not be blood splatter blood spatter throughout the house of course, the Amityville Horror was a con. The people living in that house since has absolutely no issues with it. Ed and Lorraine Warren were fundamentalist Christians who sold God in every case they investigated. I don't know. I don't want to get into uh, religion for sure. The Amityville Horror being a con, it appears it certainly was that. Ed and Lorraine Warren being con artists as well. That's for you to decide. Um, I could probably have my own opinions on that, but not enough to uh, say conclusively what I think. C.S. Walk. I really believe the Mafia had something to do with it. No, I disagree. Jillian Schmidt. They would have heard the shots, but fear could have kicked in and they froze. He walked in and told him to face the other way. It would have happened so quick. I agree with three quarters of that and maybe all of that for sure that's a good that's a good comment uh jillian debbie heel i think dawn heard the shots to try to stop them that's why he blames her she was leaving had no reason to kill the children 
She saw what he did. No one should ever get away with blaming a murder victim. You should have got her boyfriend take on it. Okay, let's address that one by one. I think Dawn heard the shots and tried to stop him. I don't, I don't believe that. There's no indication of that. Again, and I go through this in another video. If, if she's trying to stop him, there's a struggle for the gun. He shoots her. She falls on the floor. Two things. There would be evidence of blood on that floor. Two, she was portly. She weighed a lot. Defoe was skinny. Defoe. Defeo. Uh, I don't know how strong he was. Could he have lifted her up in the bed? Yes, sure. He could have, but I doubt it. He would have left her lay right there where she was killed. He's not going to pick her up, tuck her into bed, put her arms underneath the pillow, do all these things. Come on. Does that make sense? That's what you got to look at. Do things make sense? It doesn't make sense. What makes sense is she was in the bed right where she was shot and killed. That's what the evidence tells you. Trish Stewart, excellent coverage. Thanks, Ken. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for watching. Walter Sobchak. I'm so glad I found this channel. I enjoyed watching you and Style on the show. That's the hunt for the Zodiac Killer from the History Channel. If it hadn't been for the supposedly new person of interest in the Zodiac, I'd have never found this channel. So at least one good thing came out of the whole charade. All I can do is smile at that one. Thank you. Gina, the girl who helps me with everything. Premeditated, question mark. The day before, Butch claims to others to try repeatedly to call his family at the house, but no one answers the phone, setting up the crime as a mob hit. Yeah, I see I see what you're saying with that, but uh, it, and it is possible. It is certainly possible. Again, I think he had been thinking about it for a while, but I don't think he put his plan into action until that night when he was high on drugs, and uh, and he did it. So you could be absolutely right there. Jill K. sounds exactly like the Mendez brothers' story. Yes, I see that. Yep, I agree. Mel from Hell. I read a book many years ago about the Amityville Horror. I got halfway through the book and came to the conclusion it was a crock of shit. <laughs> the whole thing didn't sit right with me. Lo and behold, I found out it was a hoax and tried to get Butch off and the others to make money. Thank you for your take on this case. Well, thank you for the comment, Mel. Miranda. The mother didn't protect her children from abuse, so in his mind, in my opinion, he didn't think she loved him and his siblings. That explanation is almost the same, but a little different than the mom was sticking up for the husband instead of Butch. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Yep. Tracy Blanton, I've always said that Butch did it all, hands down. I agree with you. Tracy Blanton, you're an expert, true detective. Well, thank you, I try my very best. Rhonda Moon, no one heard all those shots. I've got a 12-gauge shotgun, and you can hear it all over the neighborhood. Do you think there may have been something evil there that pushed him over the edge? I think what pushed him over the edge was maybe is a perfect storm of him watching a violent war movie at you know minutes before the murders, his drug intake, heavily intoxicated, and the abuse of his dad to everybody, including him, and his mother sticking up for his father for that abuse. So I think it was all of that. <sighs> Lisa Faulkner, I always thought Junior acted alone. Just my opinion. I remember when this happened. Big news. Arrow, 64. The sister was involved. As the autopsy said, she died hours after the rest of them, and no one could put all those people back in bed by themselves. Come on now. Well, I would say to you, no one put them back into bed. That's where they died. Show me evidence 
where anybody was killed outside of their bed. Show it to me. Who are you? Arrow 64. Email me. Show it to me. Make me change my opinion. I promise you that did not happen. Can I say 100%? No. But I'll say 99%. They weren't placed back in bed. You would have blood evidence somewhere else. There was none. Okay? It was in the bed. So, you come on now. Tabitha, I've always wondered how six shots were fired too and nobody heard anything. Well, we don't know that they didn't hear anything. See, that's that's what is a misconception. We don't know they didn't hear anything. They're all dead. Maybe they did hear something and woke up and just laid in bed. Uh, parents, Ron Cordish, parents were shot two times each. Yes. And you know why that is, in my opinion, is because that's where most of the anger stemmed. So they got an extra an extra bullet compared to everybody else. Ron, when you look deeper, the neighbor said it was his wife's cat of a different breed, not Siamese. Okay. I think you're referring to Jody the pig with the eyes. When I researched it, I thought it said Siamese. So if I was... Wrong on that, I stand corrected. Ronald Sr. never had any money. It was all his wife's and his father-in-law's money. Okay. <sighs> Let's see. Great episode. Roberta Feldman. Thank you, Roberta. RR says, Ronald, <clears throat> Ronald DeFeo Jr. passed away on March 12, 2021. Okay, so this year he died. I knew he had died recently. So now we have a definitive date. Ann Reedy, a toxicology report would tell you if the sister had been taking drugs or had been drinking that night. He must have been tested too. If they had the same tox results, might support some of his story. The sleeping thing could be a family trait. Anyone ever watch him sleep? See, and your think your thinking is correctly. Uh, very, very good. You know, by the sleeping thing being a family trait. That's right. And that's where victimology comes in. You would talk to friends and say, hey, when you spent the night there, how did they sleep? Do you remember? Well, they started off on their back. But when I woke up in the morning, they were on their stomach. Stuff like that is very important in these cases. Uh, the talks results, from what I saw, didn't indicate anything. And again, <clears throat> that goes to Butch who said he had drugged the family during dinner. I read that in a New York Times article. And it was it came from one of the investigators in 1974. But the talks results were negative. So I don't understand that. I don't. I, I addressed that a little bit in the uh, deep dive video too. So. Okay. Joe, they were all found face down because he forced them to at gunpoint because he couldn't look at them in the eye when he shot them. Joe, that's a, uh, I mean, that is a good logical deduction. However, you can't say that because you don't know that. It's possible. But let's say... Let's say that's true with Dawn. Let's say he forced her. You think Dawn would take the time to pull the cover, the blanket, up to the back of her neck? And then let him shoot her in the back or in the in the face, in the head area? No. If that was the case, wouldn't she pull the cover all the way up over if she was scared? So, I don't... I don't believe that. I believe that they were all just sleeping in that direction, face down. There's nothing nothing unusual with that, you know, the more I think about it. Kathleen Turley, five people don't wake up after the first shot. Silencer? Question mark. If he marched them one by one at gunpoint, 
I think the dad would wrestle with him and maybe even his mom or sister protect their younger ones. It seems impossible that so many people would sleep in the same position. I I disagree with you. There's no way there's no indication that they were killed anywhere else besides their beds. I don't know how many times I have to say this to to get my point across. They're, they weren't they were killed in their beds. Plain and simple. And they were sleeping, more than likely, in the position that they were found. Now, could some of them been awake? Yes, absolutely. But they didn't get out of their bed. Bottom line. Laura Mead, so glad you're covering this case. There's something almost therapeutic about watching someone so experienced walk us through his thought process on these high profile and highly debated cases. Thank you, Detective Maines, for being so authentically you and taking us along as you think out loud. I've never felt like he's talking down to us, and so I appreciate that. Laura, thank you. I will never talk down to anybody. Um, just like Albert Einstein said, I talk to the janitor the same way I do the CEO. Hey, I, exactly, exactly. Uh, I pride myself, and I did when I was a police officer too, of never talking down to anybody. I treat everybody with respect until it's time not to re treat them with respect, okay? And that's my motto, and it always has been. Um, I, I came from a working class environment, you know, and that's just my dad instilled that in me. And you, you treat everybody. You're not higher than anybody else. I don't care if you're smarter than somebody else. You have more money than somebody else. None of that matters. You're human. You treat everybody the same way. I, I don't care what social economic background you're from. I don't care what race, what color, what religion. None of that. None of that matters to me. Um, now, I can be a prick. Don't get me wrong. But only when it's time to be. You know, you give me a reason to be. So I thank you for that comment. That means a lot to me. Uh, it really does. I plead the fifth. You're very good at what you do, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. This story caught my attention from day one. Also, were there prior murders in the house? No, there was no other prior murders that I'm aware of. 12 fluid ounce. I think he acted alone. I agree with you. Andrea Martin. I'm going to end the video on this one. This doesn't make sense. As a person who grew up in an abusive household, usually the siblings become even closer with each other. I understand the killing of the father, but do not, but not the mother and siblings. Okay. I'll try to give my opinion on it, whether it's right or wrong. You know, I'll leave that up to you to decide. But his father, according to him, was still his hero. Okay, But that is who he wanted to take out. Make no mistake about it. And I agree with you there. And But he, he had anger towards his mother for not... Sticking up for them more. Always sticking up for the husband. And that goes back to victimology. That's, you know, the way it was in the 70s, 60s, 50s. And it's even more so with uh, an Italian background. That's the way the wives were. They stuck by, you know. So, he resented that. Ronald DeFeo Jr. Jr. resented that. And... I think that that is why he not he his plan was to kill his mom and his dad his dad mom probably in that order dad mom he did that now why the siblings yes they were probably close I, I agree with that being an abusive it might have brought them closer but listen to what he says at trial when he takes the stand he specifically says once I started I could not stop okay. He was high on drugs. Boom, 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 boom. And then just, it goes, hey, why take the chance? Why take the chance of me being caught? When they can interview Allison, they can interview Don, they can interview Don, Mark, they can interview John, and all of them say, Butch did it. 
Why take that chance? So you know what? I'm going to eliminate them all. It's not unique in history. It has happened thousands of times. So one of the things I want you guys to think about, and it took me a while to come to grips with this. I used to go to crime scenes, burglary scenes, and I would stand at you know the door, look around, observe things, and say to myself, what would I have done? I just killed somebody here. I took their purse. Where would I put it? Where would I wipe the knife off of? Where would my egress be? And then I realized, Kenny, you you can't do that because you don't think like them. Okay? You just don't. You like to think that you can, but you can't. Everybody, every individual will react differently to a given circumstance. So that's very important to remember. You add alcohol. You add drugs. You add rage. You add your background, how you were raised, religious beliefs. All those things play a part into what your decision is going to be. Okay? So, to me... That's why the siblings were killed. Eliminate any witnesses. That simple. Sometimes the simplest answer is the right answer. All right. Good one. Hey, uh, go watch the other videos. This new format we have, this weekly stuff, given devoting a whole week to a case. Okay, so Monday we're going to have solved or unsolved. Tuesday, we're going to have Ken's Key Clue. Wednesday's the deep dive into the subject. Thursday's the live chat. And then Friday's is the question and answer video, which this is. And uh, hopefully you guys enjoy it. Hopefully you learn from it. And hopefully it clears up some doubt that you have. I know for me, sometimes that's the worst part. It's trying to figure out why and how it happened. You know, just think about this murder in the beginning. How did it happen? Who could kill six people? You know, that's what people think. Was it an outsider? Was it a mafia hit? Who was it? Couldn't have been anybody in the house, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, you find out it was. It was Butch DeFeo, the son. Now everybody wants to know. And that's not enough. You know, it's not enough to know that who did it. Now you want to know, well, how did he do it? In what order? Why is this here? Why is the gun there? Was he beaten by police? Oh, well, then you just can never know enough. Right? Always learning. Always curiosity. So, hopefully I taught you some things. Hopefully you learned some things. Not everybody's going to agree with me. But, you know what? It's my opinion. It's just like you have your opinions. And that's what I think. Alright, so, as always, until next week's case which is Don Miller. Now, Don Miller was my first official cold case, and uh, it'll be the 29-year anniversary of her death on Sunday. And we will go into depth about that case and everything about it and see how the justice system systematically fails. And it does. I know that's a surprise to you. And you'll see why. Okay. Till next week. Mains out. Mm -hmm.